All right. Well, anyway, um, last time we were talking about pi orbitals and uh, as a way of demonstrating molecular orbitals that extend over a whole molecule. Um, I wanted to make sort of clear what I want you to understand and what I don't care that you understand about pi orbitals. Um, recall that our example was this resonance stabilized uh, molecule. Uh, recall that we generated three pi orbitals, uh, pi 1, pi 2, and pi 3. Uh, recall that schematically we represent these pi orbitals as though uh, you had three independent p orbitals next to each other engaging in side-by-side uh, side side overlap. In reality, though, what this looks like is an extended lobe of electron density above and below the plane of the sigma bonds. I don't draw it out extended like this because uh, this method helps you remember that there are three atoms there. Um, the highest energy orbital we said was the one that had uh, phase switches between each atom uh, nodes there and then the middle one was this sort of strange one that also has a node that coincides with where carbon two is, all right? And uh, in this molecule, we said you have uh, four electrons that are involved in resonance, the two in the pi bond and the two in the lone pair. We fill up the pi orbitals with the available electrons and then we choose homo and lumo based on which is the highest occupied versus lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Now, I'm not, I showed you where these orbitals come from, mostly because students in the past have been troubled by this middle one that has a node at the central carbon, and I was trying to explain why that was the case. Um, what you really need to be able to do is, given a set of pi orbitals that I draw for you, tell me, uh, can you, can you rank them in energy and tell me which one would be the homo and which one would be the lumo? Um, and to do that, we only need to count the nodes. We need to be able to count nodes. Remember I told you with math in this class, aside from that second derivative business, which was kind of a fiasco, if you can count and divide by two, you're fine. Well, this is one of those times where we're gonna count. If you can count nodes, you're good. Um, and then, wait a minute, you were in the last lecture, so you are seeing that my, Hannah, right? Yeah. You are seeing that my jokes are recycled. Oh sure, no, sorry. spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'm embarrassed. You threw off my groove, Hannah. Sorry. <laughs> I still think it's funny the second time. <laughs> That's good, I think it's funny the second time too, so. All right, um, where were we? Yeah, so you rank them in energy by counting the nodes, recalling that the more nodes an orbital has, the higher in energy it is. So um, let me give you a new situation. This is maybe related uh, to an exam question I've asked before. Um, and let's put lone pairs on that. Adam, and let's just number these one, two, three, four, and five. Hopefully you can see that there are resonance structures where I move the pi bonds around and move the lone pairs around. Okay. we would conclude from these resonance structures that each of those atoms is trigonal planar, uh, that each is sp2 hybridized, and that each has a p orbital orthogonal to the plane of the page coming out above and below the plane of the page and that these p orbitals can line up together and mix together to form a system of pi molecular orbitals. And I'm just showing one of the options where 
the pi, uh, where they all line up together in phase. So um, what I would do with a question like this is I would present a series of options for uh, the pi orbitals that we're going to mix together, these five p orbitals we're going to mix together to get five pi molecular orbitals. Uh, and I would draw them for you uh, with the phase filled in, sine of the wave function filled in. Uh, and then I would ask you to rank them in energy and then fill them with the available electrons. Um, sorry. Ah. And then one last one. And for fun, I might draw, you know there's only gonna be five, right? There's, there only can be five, but for fun, I'll probably throw in a few extra bogus answers. To confuse people, so maybe six instead, I don't know. Um, but I won't do that today. All right, so here is one of our options. This is an option where you've got um, a lot of wave function sign changes. Here's another option, here's another one. Here's another one, and then there's the last. So I would, I've honestly given those as options A through E on an exam before and said, okay, which one is the HOMO? Uh, or I could ask which one is the LUMO. Um, so to do this, you didn't need to, didn't need to generate them, but you are gonna need to count. So we count nodes and a node is any time the wave function sign changes. So for example, uh, this orbital on the lower right hand side does have one node. It is horizontal in the plane of the page as we've drawn the molecule like this in the plane of the sigma bonds and the carbon atoms. But of course, all of these orbitals have that node. If you look at all of them, there's a wave function ch shift in sign as you go from top to bottom. So that's the same in all of them, so we're not gonna worry about that one. What we're looking for are the vertical nodes that we encounter as we go from side to side. Um, so counting, uh, you just need to look every place the wave function changes sign. So that one looks like it has four. Uh, the dots will represent locations where a node coincides with one of the carbon atoms, in this case with C3. Uh, there's no, the uh, wave function is zero at C3. Same thing here, only there are also nodes in between one and two and four and five. In this orbital, you've got two nodes, one core coincides with C2, the other coincides with C4, and then the last one doesn't have any vertical nodes. All right, so count the nodes, zero, one, two, three. Count the many spots where wave function equals zero. Name them one by one. Thank you for the chuckles. As I told you last time, you can laugh at me. You don't have to laugh with me. Um, right, so let's order them in energy now. This one has got to be the lowest, one node. This one is the next one, two. This one is three, four, ooh, where'd it go? And then five. And for convenience, now that we've got multiple orbitals, it no longer makes sense to call one pi and the other pi star. We're just gonna number them uh, one through five. <laughs> Okay, question so far about how we got there. Anybody looking at the chat, anybody know? Okay, Roger or Emma, or am I missing anything? Anything on the, uh, on the chat that I need to address?
negative. Okay? I don't think so. I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. So at this stage, we count the number of electrons that are involved in this system of pi orbitals. Uh, we'll call it the pi system, and the electrons that are involved in it we'll call the pi electrons. And those are any electrons that are participating in resonance. Resonance can happen when you have pi bonds adjacent to each other and or lone pairs adjacent to pi bonds and or positive charges adjacent to pi bonds. So in this case, we've got two, oops, two, four, six electrons. So we can fill the orbitals up from bottom to top as we, uh, and then we run out of electrons and we would conclude that pi three is the homo and pi four is the lumo. So that's sort of what you need to be able to do. Um, questions? Yeah, go ahead. Also, oh, I just, you got six because there's the five bends and then the negative sign. There's yeah, the, well, uh, I'm getting six from the fact that there's two in that bond, two in that pi bond, and then two in the lone pair. Yeah. Go ahead. Wouldn't the resonance structure on the right and the left be the same if you flipped it? Yes, by symmetry it would be. Though remember, resonance doesn't involve any movement at all, and so what we were what we would be saying here is that uh, at least the resonance picture is that this negative charge is delocalized among atoms one, three, and five which incidentally is the same thing you get from the MO picture, right? Because the HOMO, the highest energy electrons, the most reactive electrons, are in an orbital that's only on one, three, and five. Kind of cool, and, and it will generally work out that way, um, that in, in anions like this, the place where the negative charge is in the resonance structure is usually where the homo is in the in the in the molecular orbitals. Yeah. So up the top, you said there were five p orbitals possible, which are five pi bonds for molecular orbitals. So are those the only five options that are possible? It's a great question. We mixed five uh, p orbitals together to get five molecular orbitals. Are those the only possible combinations? No. And so how do you know those are the ones? And this gets into, well, how did I know to draw them? I'm not gonna ask you to do that, but there are a few tools that I can spend just a minute talking about. One is you remember that weird symmetry rule from the study guide about combining MOs? We said that, that they had to be symmetric or anti-symmetric relative to the molecule. If you look, um, I'm gonna use, I don't know, a red line for a plane of symmetry, not a node. The lowest energy orbital is symmetric. Everything on the left is the same as what's on the right. The next one is anti-symmetric. The wave function sign switches from left to right. And as you move up, there's this pattern of alternating symmetry. Symmetric, anti-symmetric, symmetric, and so on. Um, the reason these orbitals look this way is because this is the only way you can put one node in the molecule and still have it obey the symmetry rule. Um, and so, and, and, and uh, that symmetry rule comes out of the math of MO theory. In, in MO theory, you basically mix the wave functions together and then you ask how much of this orbital is on carbon one versus carbon two versus three, four, and five. And for this energy level, it tells you zero of the orbital is on carbon three, as an example. Um, a final unsatisfied, well, final answer is if you were to draw up all of the possibilities that are unique for having one node, for example, if you put it here or you put it there, and then you added them all up, you would get this answer. All right, but you're not gonna have to do that. It's not actually that hard if you know the symmetry requirement and if you know nodes. 
um, that that symmetry requirement really sort of explains the, the places where the nodes coincide with specific atoms because there's no other place the nodes could be and obey the symmetry rules. Um, but, and, and, and incidentally, uh, pi systems that have an odd number of atoms will always have nodes, some nodes that lie, that coincide with some of the atoms. Um, to, if you have an even number of atoms, that's not the case. For example, 1,3-butadiene um, has highest energy orbital that looks like this. The nodes are all in between the atoms. And again, I wouldn't be asking you to come up with this on your own. But given the answers, given what the orbitals look like, can you rank them in energy and say which one's homo or lumo? That's a case where the nodes still, one, two, three uh, nodes, we still follow the pattern of symmetric, anti-symmetric, symmetric, and anti-symmetric, but there are no nodes on the atoms just because of the symmetry. All right, a little bit of an aside. Go ahead. Yeah, so the, the, the question is, how do I know that there are going to be five pi molecular orbitals? If I look at this molecule, let me redraw it here. Um, if I were thinking purely from a valence bond perspective, I would say that is a pi bond, and that pi bond comes from adding one p orbital with another p orbital, right? And that, then this pi bond would also come from adding one p orbital with another p orbital. I would need resonance uh, to conclude, uh, as we did last time, uh, carbon five is sp2 hybridized here. It's got to be sp2 hybridized there. Uh, so that lone pair also must be in a p orbital. And that's where I get this idea that on adjacent atoms in a connected line, I have one, two, three, four, five p orbitals. And then I'm mixing those together to make the molecular orbitals. Yeah? And then how do you know how many electrons to fill in the valence spaces? Good, yeah. This is, this is the other way you can get these questions wrong is even if you order them in energy, if you count the electrons wrong, you're going to get the question wrong. So how do you know how many? You count the pi bonds that are adjacent to each other and lone pairs adjacent to those pi bonds. Okay, so one, two pairs of electrons, and then three, so six electrons overall. Um, if I redrew the molecule and made a brief change, those lone pairs are not part of the pi system because there is an orbital in between, there is an atom in between them that doesn't have a p orbital on it. Um, molecules with a, uh, a, a continuous line of p orbitals are said to be conjugated, and conjugation and resonance are sort of used interchangeably in organic chemistry. So a lone pair that is conjugated with the pi system is one that is adjacent to the double bonds and can participate in resonance. All right. Um, speaking of that resonance, is it also true that you can't have, um, or you you can't have nodes on the second and the fourth carbon atoms because if you draw the electron movement in resonance with the arrows, is that another reason why you can't have um, uh, p orbitals on C two and four? Oh. Because from the study guide, if you if you draw the electron movement in resonance using that arrow technique. You see that if you move a lone pair um, to the left, then you must also move the pi bond, right? Yeah. So, so for folks here in the classroom that didn't may not have quite heard that, uh, another reason that you know that you've got nodes on carbons two and three is when you deal with the negative charge in this resonance structure, 
using the arrow technique, you move a lone pair over to make a pi bond, but if you're gonna keep the octet rule, you have to move the pi bond over to make a lone pair. Never do you have a lone pair on carbon two or carbon four. And, and, and you'll see that um, the HOMO here is on one, three, and five, and those are precisely the locations that resonance tells you the negative charge is. All right. Um, a question for triple bonds. Okay. How would a trip? Uh, how would we go about those? How would a triple bond affect this thing? Well, a triple bond can participate in resonance, but only one of the two pi bonds can be involved. As a, as an example, um, let's suppose we just change our molecule so that. This is the situation. Um, um, only one of those two pi bonds could be involved in resonance. Because remember with a triple bond, one of the pi bonds comes from p orbitals in this direction, and the other pi bond comes from p orbitals in an orthogonal direction. So for a triple bond, only one of the two pi bonds can be involved in uh, resonance. Good. All right, um, one interesting thing is that once you've identified the HOMO and the LUMO, this energy difference here, this delta E, or we'll sometimes call it the HOMO-LUMO gap, uh, is the energy that would be required uh, for a photon to come and excite this electron from pi three up to pi four. Um, for molecules like this, say one three, uh, this one three butadiene as an example, uh, that we just went through really quickly. The homo-lumo gap there is in the ultraviolet region. You can calculate what that frequency would be, but it's ultraviolet for, um, for butadiene. And a lot of molecules that are conjugated absorb in the UV. In fact, we use a lot of them as sunscreen, right? You smear molecules on you that absorb the UV light and it doesn't get to your skin. Um, Stay tuned for 352 to learn what actually goes on in your skin when the sun, when the UV light gets there. Um, and it, it turns, oh, and, and uh, it turns out that if we can, if this energy gap between HOMO and LUMO gets small enough, we can start to absorb light in the visible region of the spectrum. And so all of the colors that we see or that our, that our clothing is made of, uh, the, the clothing has dye in it that absorbs light in the visible region and those molecules are highly conjugated. Um, and again, in 352, you might learn a little bit more about dye molecules. Uh, it will turn out that the more p orbitals we put in a chain, the smaller that gap between HOMO and LUMO gets. It's almost as though you're trying to cram more molecular orbitals into the same energy area and eventually uh, it gets, that gap gets small enough to be seen in the visible region. So this has everything to do with how on earth it is that we, that our eyes can see. So uh, I'm not terribly good at this. I had to look up the structure last time and I'm having to look up the structure again. Hannah can testify to how much time this took, large stuff. Um, there's a methyl group here and then And then this bond is cis. There's another pi bond with another methyl group. So I'm sorry if I've gotten some of the details wrong on this. Um, and I realize none of you in the classroom actually can see what I was drawing. <laughs> there we go. Um, this molecule is called 11 cis retinal. If you've heard of retinol, it's the alcohol version where 
you'd have an OH there. Um, this molecule is embedded in a protein in your rod and cone cells. So in your eye at the back is a retina. In that retina are rod and cone cells. Uh, in the membranes of those rod and cone cells, you have a prote protein called rhodopsin. And inside that protein, uh, you have this molecule. And it's attached to one of the amino acids of that protein. So this is the protein rhodopsin. And rhodopsin is a membrane protein. Um, and it's, I believe, an ion channel. And it's involved in light signaling. So if you look at 11 cis retinal, you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 atoms in a continuous array of pi bonds. So I would be mixing 12 p orbitals together to get 12 new molecular orbitals out. And it so happens that the homo-lumo gap for this molecule is in the visible region of the spectrum. And you can tune that a little bit with the environment of the protein. So you have some uh, uh, cells that see red, some that see green, some that see uh, blue, apparently. And maybe I'm getting that wrong, so sorry. Um, how does the signal occur? Well, it turns out that this cis double bond, for reasons we'll talk about in more detail later, is somewhat unstable. And that is because the proton here bumps into the methyl group there. They're in each other's way, and it causes a little bit of twisting of the molecule, twisting it from its preferred low energy shape. And if you shoot a photon of light and it absorbs at this molecule and it absorbs it, you promote an electron from a homo to a lumo. A light is absorbed, but remember, whenever you promote an electron to an antibonding orbital, you should weaken a bond. Uh, and that process weakens bonding in this molecule enough that the double bond is able to isomerize and flip back to, from being cis to being trans. We've talked, uh, uh, maybe, uh, some of you in office hours, I think, have talked with me about how uh, pi bonds, we don't rotate around pi bonds uh, because doing so would destroy overlap between the p orbitals. But when we weaken one of the pi bonds, it turns out you can rotate. And so we snap back from cis to trans. Now, that may not look like a big deal, but it makes the molecule inside this protein go from sort of curve shape to linear. That changes the shape of the protein, triggers the protein to open up an ion channel. And that creates an action potential that gets transmitted down the optic nerve and interpret it in your brain and you can see. And all of that's been going on while you're sitting here and we've taken like five, 10 minutes talking about it. All of that's been going on the whole time. Um, so this is kind of cool. And, and, and as I said to the, to the last class, in addition to teaching you things that you think you need to memorize to take the MCAT or the DAT someday, I want you to gain the confidence that you can understand the world around you at the molecular level and that you can have some of these aha moments where you see really some of the beauty and the logic in all of God's creations. And this sort of homo lumo example is one of the, is one of the coolest. And um, if you've learned about it before in like neuroscience or in biology, they may not have told you about the homo lumo stuff, but there was so much ochem going on in there and you didn't even know it. Um, cool. As you may be interested and you can read more about it, but once you isomerize to the trans, that rhodopsin protein is useless and it gets translocated to the retinal pigment epithelial cells, which clip out the trans molecule and reattach a cis molecule and then send it back to the rod or cone cells for further vision. And uh, this is why if you stare at a bright light for long enough, you can actually um, overwhelm the ability of the rod and cone cells in that region of your eye to recycle. It's called photo bleaching, and this is where after images come from and so on. Kind of, kind of fun. 
All right. Questions about identifying HOMO and LUMO in, in, in pi orbitals? Yeah. There are, go ahead. Pi bonds versus sigma bonds, right? Um, so all of the individual single lines are sigma bonds. And if you imagine, this molecule isn't quite planar, but if you imagine that it is, all of the pi bonds are in space above and below where those sigma bonds are. Yeah. So they are there, but they don't participate in the process, in part because sigma bonds are always lower in energy than pi bonds. And so for the most part, we can ignore them. So with the hybrid approach, do you use both pi and sigma bonds? Right. And OK, yeah, so I guess the question that you're asking is, how is it that we make these pi orbitals and we're only worried about the pi orbitals instead of the sigma ones? Good question. That has to do with the fact that um, we could do a full molecular orbital treatment of the sigma bonds too, uh, but we would find that all of the orbitals involving the sigma bonds are in the plane of the page here and none of them are above and below. And so it just turns out that in molecules like this, the pi orbitals are totally independent of the sigma bonds. They're 90 degrees apart from each other. They can't interact or, or be affected by each other. So it's actually fine for us to treat the pi orbitals separately. Yeah. Let's see. So the bond we're rotating around is this one. And it's like you take all of this. I mean, OK, fine. You take all of this and you swing it around to the other side. So you're right. It is rotation around both a sigma and a pi bond. The, that can't usually happen without breaking the pi bond, and the reason it can happen here is because you've excited the molecule with light. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, just going back to where we were talking about the interface. Yeah. There's a few questions on the study guide where it asks us to identify the homo and the homo that can impose onto the molecule. Yeah. Um, so, for example, in this one, we have a pi 3, and we have it's on 1, 3, 5, it's on 3, 5. Yeah. Yeah, so if I were going to draw the molecule and draw where the HOMO is, I would, depending on how we choose to look at this molecule from the side or above, if we were looking at it from above, I would do something like this. And maybe I would show the lobe that's below um, the page. Alternatively, if I were going to draw it from the side, uh, I might do something like that. Yeah. Okay. So we've dealt with pi systems, and we've had a little detour into the wonders of vision. Um, but we're going to need to develop the skills to be able to look at the structure of a molecule, even one that doesn't have a conjugated pi system, and identify its HOMO and its LUMO. The reason for this is that... Um, is that most reactions in organic chemistry are going to involve the HOMO of an a electron-rich molecule attacking the LUMO of an electron-poor molecule. And this is a point your study guide makes. And before I show you how to identify HOMO and LUMO, I want to show you why you should care. Um, so this is an example. Uh, and you may not be able to identify these as such now, but that's fine. I wouldn't expect you to. This is methanol uh, here, and methanol is an electron-rich molecule. Uh, another way of saying that is that it is a nucleophile, and another way of saying that is that it is a Lewis base. 
For electron-rich molecules or nucleophiles or Lewis bases, we're going to care about what the HOMO is, what the highest energy electrons are. In contrast, BH3, borane, is an electrophile. It is electron poor. That's why it loves electrons, an electrophile, and we will also call it a Lewis acid. For electrophiles or Lewis acids or electron poor molecules, we're going to care about where the LUMO is because that's where, when it finally gets the electrons it loves, that's where they're going to go. So um, these uh, shown here on the left is the results of some uh, quantum mechanical uh, calculations for these molecules, identifying the HOMO and the LUMO. Um, the HOMO on the methanol is an orbital on oxygen, uh, an occupied orbital on oxygen. This is one of the oxygen lone pairs. Okay. Um, and it looks like it's in a p orbital. Um, it will be fine if you think of lone pairs on oxygens in molecules like this as being in hybrid orbitals too. It, it won't really matter. Uh, for BH3, the LUMO is an empty p orbital on boron. These uh, are the numbers give you uh, energy levels, uh, which are in units of Hartree's, whatever those are, that doesn't, the units don't matter, but they are placed on this vertical axis to scale. Uh, so this one's at about the area you would expect for uh, zero, and then the lone pairs on oxygen are a little bit lower than that. I wouldn't expect you to predict why or, or that they would be there. But the key point is, if I mix the HOMO of my nucleophile, with the LUMO of my electrophile, I'm going to get a new orbital. And it's actually a bonding orbital that allows my electrons to move lower in energy. To see how this happens, just imagine taking this blue lobe, taking methanol, and moving it over so the blue lobe on oxygen overlaps with the blue lobe on boron. If you zoom in to the structure we get, you have a bond between the two. And then this is the shape of that new orbital. It's a sigma bonding orbital between oxygen and boron. Um, notice now that boron's attached to four things instead of three, it rehybridizes and becomes more tetrahedral-like. Uh, also notice that the shape of this orbital is pretty much what you would expect from taking uh, an sp3, or, or I'm sorry, pretty much what you would expect to get if you overlapped the LUMO from boron with the HOMO from uh, oxygen. Okay, You have a lobe in between the two atoms that's uh, where the electrons mostly are, and then smaller lobes on the outside. Not shown is the sigma star, the antibonding orbital that would have been formed, because the point I wanted to make here is simply that when you mix HOMO and LUMO together, you get a new bond. All right? Um, and we show that in organic chemistry with a curved arrow drawn from the lone pair electrons on the oxygen and pointing towards boron. And that arrow shows you not only what's going on in terms of HOMO or LUMO, but it also tells you where the bond is going to be in the product. All right. So that's why we care about identifying HOMO versus LUMO. I'll show you one more example. Uh, this is an example where the HOMO of one molecule attacks the LUMO of the other, but the LUMO is not a p orbital. It's a sigma star. It's an antibonding orbital. And the thing you need to remember to be able to get through this is that when you, when you fill an antibonding orbital, its associated bond breaks. So uh, in this case, we have a molecule with an alkene. The HOMO is the pi bond, the pi uh, orbital, the electrons in that pi orbital. The LUMO is the hydrogen chloride sigma star. This is HCl. And what happens when you dump 
electron density from the HOMO into the LUMO is first you're going to make a new bond between one of these two carbons and hydrogen. And then because this is an antibonding orbital, you're going to break the hydrogen chlorine bond. Now, this is a chapter 10 reaction, so it is not yet clear to you why we attack the hydrogen instead of the chlorine, nor is it clear to you yet why in the product of this step the carbon out here on the end gets the hydrogen instead of the one in the middle, and the one in the middle is left with a positive charge. There are reasons for that. They're not that hard to understand, and we'll talk about it, but we're not there yet. The point is that we get this new carbon-hydrogen sigma bond from HOMO attacking the LUMO, all right? So we need to get good at identifying HOMO versus LUMO. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so there are a few ways to do this, and um, you can do the slow way, which I recommend at first, and then as you get uh, more experienced, you can go the, the faster way. Uh, slow way involves looking at the molecule, thinking about all the bonds in the molecule, and then uh, coming to uh, filling up the available orbitals with the electrons, and then deciding which one's HOMO or LUMO. So to do the slow way, I first look at the kinds of bonds I have. I have four carbon-hydrogen sigma bonds, and that means I'm also going to have four carbon-hydrogen sigma star antibonding orbitals. Um, then I look and see that I have one carbon-oxygen sigma bond, and that also means I'm going to have one carbon-oxygen sigma star. And finally, oh, you know what? I saw some confusion slash consternation. Sorry about that. There's, there's three carbon-hydrogen bonds and one oxygen-hydrogen bond with the associated oxygen-hydrogen sigma star. And then I have to take care of the electrons that are on the oxygen, these two lone pairs. All right, so uh, then I need to rank them in energy. To do this, I sort of mark our break-even point, the place where non-bonding orbitals tend to be. And then I remind myself that sigma bonds are more stable than lone pairs because lone pairs only get to experience one nucleus, whereas sigma bonds get to experience multiple nuclei. That's why a bonding orbital is a bonding orbital because it's lower in energy than a lone pair. So I would expect the sigma bonding orbitals to all be lower in energy. Now, I've got multiple kinds of sigma orbitals, right? I have a carbon hydrogen sigma, a carbon oxygen sigma, and oxygen hydrogen sigma. They're not all the same energy, and you could look up bond energies and figure out which one's lowest and which one's highest and so on. It's not going to matter for this molecule because none of them are going to be the highest occupied molecular orbital. So it will be fine for us to just say, okay, I've got three carbon-hydrogen sigma orbitals, one carbon-oxygen, and one oxygen-hydrogen sigma bonding orbital. Um, and each of those bonding orbitals is filled with two electrons. Then I'll remind myself that up here I have the same number of sigma star orbitals. But I haven't done anything with the lone pairs yet. Where should the lone pairs be? At my break-even point, right? Because they're not involved in bonds. So I, I can put them there. They're filled. Oh, hey, look. They must be, those lone pairs must be the highest energy electrons in the molecule. Okay? This analysis leads us to shortcut number one, which is when trying to identify HOMO and LUMO, first look for lone pairs. If you find them, they will basically always be the HOMO of the molecule. All right? Question on that. So what if there's no lone pairs, but it's all sigma bonds, and you just have sigma bonds on the bottom and anti-sigma bonds on the top? Very what would you say it's homo-lumo? Good question. So if there's no lone pairs and it's just sigma bonds, 
then you probably have a boring molecule. Um, uh, it would probably not be very reactive. Uh, there are some molecules that have low energy sigma stars that are interesting and we'll talk about them. But, you know, in general, a molecule of the kind you're talking about might be this hydrocarbon, uh, octane, which you can use as a solvent and you can burn it to run your engines, but there's not a lot of controlled reactions you can do with it because all its electrons are really low in energy and all its empty orbitals are really high in energy. Does that mean there's all of them are the homo and all of them are the lumo? Um, does, no, does that mean all of them are the homo and all of them are the lumo? No, at that point you would have to start worrying about energy differences between different kinds of sigma bonds. But no, I would not ask you to tell me what the homo and lumo of that molecule is. Because it would be hard to make that distinction. Yeah. So what would be the difference between a lone pair on oxygen versus a lone pair on like nitrogen? Good question. So what if uh, what what is the difference between a lone pair on oxygen versus a lone pair on nitrogen? We're gonna um, in chapter two develop a way of knowing which lone pairs are most reactive. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but here is a molecule that has multiple lone pairs on it. Um, one is more reactive than the others. It turns out the nitrogen is the most, uh, it has the highest energy lone pair. And the reason for that is electronegativity. We will see that uh, lone pairs on atoms that are more electronegative are lower in energy. Um, and what would you say is the homo in this case? Well, it would be enough to recognize that there are multiple lone pairs that could be reactive but one is probably more reactive than the others. Many of the organic molecules that we're interested in will actually have multiple places where they could react, and that's part of the challenge. All right. Um, so a couple of, of examples. Uh, I will say with BH3, like we did in that initial example, you look at it and you would come to the conclusion that there are three boron hydrogen sigma bonds, three corresponding sigma stars. Boron is trigonal planar, sp2 hybridized, and there is left over from that a p orbital that doesn't have any electrons in it. Now that is an atomic orbital, so that has to be higher in energy than your bonding orbitals are. And it also has to be lower in energy than you, where your antibonding orbitals are. Because it's not involved in bonding at all. That puts it basically at the break-even point where it would be our LUMO. And we will see that in molecules that have empty p orbitals, that is almost always the LUMO. Because it's lower in energy than any of the pi star or sigma stars will be. So look for lone pairs. Look for empty p orbitals look for pi bonds, and then finally look for uh, sigma stars of weak bonds uh, with carbon. Um, so a quick example, and I think we'll need to push back the study guide due date even further. Probably we'll finish this up on Wednesday. Monday's a holiday. I want you to be able to look at a molecule like this and say, oh, the HOMO is lone pairs on the oxygen, has to be, and the LUMO is the pi star, has to be, okay? And the reason you know that is because pi bonds are weaker than sigma bonds, meaning pi orbitals are higher in energy than sigma orbitals, which also means that pi stars are lower in energy than sigma stars. So um, this little chart may summarize sort of how to find HOMO and LUMO. You look for lone pairs, and if there's not lone pairs, the HOMO might be a pi bond. If there's not a pi bond, the HOMO might have to be a sigma bond, and probably it's a boring molecule. 
if uh, for the LUMO, you look for empty P orbitals. If that's not there, look for pi, because the pi star might be the LUMO. And if that's not there, you got to look for a sigma star associated with a weak bond. All right, so that's more than we had time for. I'm sorry. Uh, have a great weekend, and I will see you on Wednesday. <laughs>